Okay, so I'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, thank you for putting this together and for uh, including us, inviting us to participate. Um, so I am uh, Denise Felsenthal. I'm the Director of Information Technology, um, providing the IT strategic direction, security, compliance, governance, and oversight and operational support for the Fulton Schools of Engineering. We are the largest and most comprehensive engineering program in the United States with close to 24,000 students and 355 uh, tenure track faculty. So we offer 25 undergraduate programs, 46 graduate programs across seven of our schools. So we are large. Um, one of the services that we provide is classroom support. So our team provides um, support for close to 41 classroom spaces. Um, and these spaces are specific to school, program specific uh, core computing lab facilities across all six of our schools. So some of these spaces are general purpose, like our high performance computing lab, which is open to all of our students, while some of the other spaces are more program specific, specific like CAD lab facilities for our School of Electrical Engineering and our School of Engineering of Matter, Transport and Energy. So once the pandemic hit, we knew that we had to uh, move pretty quickly as far as trying to figure out how we were going to continue to provide services uh, specific to these labs. So our goal was to get students, faculty, and support staff on site as quickly as, to get support staff off site as quickly as possible. So last fall, we designed a model leveraging the University Citrix uh, BDI environment for a computer science class so they can remotely log in when they're doing coding assignments. The students could see lights blinking on the boards through the camera. So if the lights lit up the way they were supposed to, the students and professors knew they did the assignments correctly. So that model last fall was a very successful. So we partnered with the University Technology Office very quickly to replicate this model in as many labs as possible to provide students with this remote access to our academic core facilities. So within two weeks, we had about 18 virtual labs up and running very quickly for our community. So Sean Usman is also joining us today and his team um, oversees the classroom team and he can provide a little bit more detail specifically on operationally how we did that. Thanks, Denise. Um, I do have a PowerPoint slide if uh, people do want me to share that. It has a couple of screenshots that might help visualize uh, what we have. So um, I'll see if I'm able to do that. All right, I'm assuming people are able to see the screen. Um, so basically, um, the results of what we did, what, what Denise has talked about is we converted 18 of our physical labs to virtual remote labs. That's about 500 Windows PCs. So, um, and these labs belong to, you know, each of our six different engineering schools and each of the labs have different applications, you know, a lot of specialized engineering applications in each lab. So this basically enabled our student base to have access to over a hundred applications uh, remotely. Um, and then the remote, we did confirm remote access with the terms of use for the applications. And in a couple of cases had to get vendor permissions to be able to do this, but especially with the current environment, um, vendors were um, eager to be helpful. So this uh, screenshot shows what a student would see. Well, in this case, it would be a student who has access to all labs. Most of the students will only see you know, two or three labs, you know, or, you know, however many they normally would have access to. Um, but, but it's basically a pretty simple interface. They go to the website, they log in, they get a list of the labs that they can use. And then once they click on a lab, they get entry into one of the systems. So the student's experience, uh, you know, the whole idea of it was to make it as seamless as possible. We do have some security things like VPN is required, but other than that, they log into the portal, um, they click on a lab, they get the computer's login prompt, and then they use the computer as normal. 
students are not assigned to machines one by one to one they get a random machine that's available at that moment in the room so say a lab has you know 24 systems and you know 10 are already used they'll get one of the other 14 right the access management again we already had uh, door access for most of the labs using an isaac system so we just took that uh, door access list and brought it over to this environment. So the same students that have a, ha, had access physically to the labs are the ones who have access virtually to the labs. Um, in a couple of cases, we use course rosters as well. So um, that's also doable. The computers themselves, we did have to, um, we do have them configured so that they log off users in most of the labs after 15 minutes of idle time. In simulation heavy labs, we have that set to four hours of idle time. This way, one of the benefits of a physical class is, you know, a physical lab is a student comes in, the room is used up, other students who see the students are waiting, they're willing to get up if they're not using the computer. With a virtual lab, obviously students don't see that, so having a idle log off time um, helps with that. Some technical details, these are all Windows 10 systems. They're joined to our domain, which is managed with group policies. And we also manage them using SCCM for OS and software deployments. So that was our existing configuration. The new configuration details we did was we installed a Citrix agent that's deployed and configured on the systems um, via SCCM in our case. We have some power policies that we changed. So basically we prevent users from powering down systems. Um, one of the worst things that might happen would be a user powers down a system and now nobody can use that system anymore because somebody has to visit it to power it back on. So we prevent users from powering down systems. We do have a scheduled daily restart um, just because certain things can build up over time and a restart clears those out. Um, we had to work with our networking group to enable the routing for the VDI to work. We had to work with our Citrix VDI admins to configure and enable this portal. Um, and, uh, but, but that was easier to do this time because we had already done that back in fall with the example that Denise gave um, for that special um, um, software engineering lab uh, with the boards and the camera. And then we also um, you know, had to bring over the access lists from Isaac or class rosters into Active Directory via security groups. So some of the benefits is we, we can still actually support physical users. So we actually have a hybrid model. So we did have, you know, after the pandemic started for a couple of weeks, a couple of our labs were still open for physical users. So the physical users and the remote users can use the same pool of machines. If a machine is in use, it's in use regardless of which one. We did, um, as part of this, I had to skip one. We did as part of this, um, use group policies to disable the physical power button in labs. So that prevents uh, any physical students from kicking off remote users, you know, just because they don't see a user on there, they cannot um, get in uh, by just pressing the power button. Um, because uh, we already had the infrastructure in place to do this, we had a very quick turnaround time to convert all the labs. It basically took us two days to convert the first lab and a total of five days to convert all 18 of these labs. So, so that was pretty quick, yeah. Um, we can monitor remotely via a Citrix director console. So we can see how many systems are in use, if any systems are in an error state, um, you know, what the utilization is, we can do reports on it. Um, and then um, the applications that run on the computers, they're using the lab systems computing power. So the students that are remoting in, what their systems remoting, uh, computing power is, is irrelevant. You know, they could have a pretty basic system. Um, even their networking doesn't have to be that strong. Um, because all that's coming across is the screen. So this is an example of the Citrix director. It shows one of our labs, in this case, our high performance computing lab, um, and in, which has about 24 systems. And it shows over the last 24 hours, it's been about, you know, uh, it's, it's been pretty heavily used. And, and you can see evening times seems to be when it's used more, um, which is actually interesting because some of our labs didn't used to be open in the evenings and we're seeing evening use is actually a lot higher. So we're thinking we probably will be continuing to have this hybrid model in place even once physical labs open back up. Um, as for labs with, uh, that have other physical needs other than just the computer. Um, so as long as the physical components are fully managed via software, um, like we did with that software engineering lab, and we just did with another lab this week, 
we can add webcams. And actually one of our lab managers um, had the brilliant idea of adding LED lights so that when the room goes dark, um, you know, which, you know, some of our rooms work on sensors. So if there's no physical activity, they go dark. The LED lights still maintain visibility of the equipment. So then students can use the remote uh, computer and they see through the webcam, the device that they're uh, operating with. So that's all everything I had to share. Um, if anybody has any questions, I think I can answer those. Oh, should we maybe do the questions after uh, all three of the presentations? That's fine with me as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, cool, I'm, I'm up next. Uh, as I said before, Margot Vigent from Bucknell University. I am a chemical engineering professor, but my research area is in engineering education. And one of the things I've looked at is the uh, conceptual benefits of different educational approaches. So we have both developed and tested virtual labs versus the physical versions of the same thing. And I wanna share with you some ways that you could use what we learned in uh, converting your own physical, so not computational labs into things that either students can do from home or perhaps uh, experience remotely with video. And something I have found very helpful in thinking about this is a really great Journal of Engineering Education paper. Um, I put a link to it or I, I, I put its um, uh, citation in the chat. It's all the way up at the top so you can scroll up um, from Faisal and Rosa in 2005. And the thing that I find um, helpful in this particular instance is they came up with a list of 13 fundamental object objectives that engineering laboratories tend to have. And quite often we think of any lab we're doing as maybe hitting all of these. And so I'll grab the screen share for a moment just to show you uh, what this looks like. Here you go. Um, this is small. I don't expect you to be able to read the whole thing. But you can see we expect a lot of heavy lifting out of our laboratories. We expect students to learn about instrumentation, the differences between theory and practice, how to actually do experimental design, how to analyze data, uh, how to design equipment, um, learning from failure, creativity, psychomotor skills, safety, communication, teamwork, uh, ethics, and uh, one of my favorite sensory awareness. So when we are taking something that is a physical laboratory and bringing it online, um, I like using this list to look at what I thought my current lab, my typical lab was doing, and then focus in on what components of that I can still preserve remotely. So uh, teamwork and communication, yes, absolutely. Um, psychomotor, probably not so much, but we can get pretty far by um, figuring out the subset of objectives we are willing to be happy with and then finding a way to operate on those. Uh, <clears throat> so you've probably heard before, for example, about people uh, continuing to get data analysis as something that their students can do uh, by uh, giving the students data that they can analyze from home. So I'm gonna show you something else for a moment. Um, in my own class, how that has worked out, and we're, I'm not gonna make you watch the video, but I will put a link to it in the, in the chat so you can look at it yourself, is uh, my labs are primarily designed for conceptual learning. And so what I want out of that is, is kind of a, a theory and practice and observation element. So how I have transported this to something they can do at home is I still ask them to do the pre-lab in which they predict what is going to happen based on what they know. And I expect them to do the post-lab, the write-up that is a reflection on what they saw happen. And in the middle, I have provided them a video of the actual experiment. In this case, um, lower flammability limit of ethanol, uh, which sounds really technical, but uh, it's a video of me making bananas foster. Uh, so I'll put the link in the chat so you can watch that at your own leisure later. Uh, but this is something that you can use as a lens to create your own labs and perhaps um, even in, in short scale experiments. So that is, it doesn't have to be a big thing using a whole distillation column anymore or heavy duty lab equipment, but 
Uh, there are many resources online where there's videos of, say, people in power plants or uh, people uh, at um, industrial sites where you could use a clip out of that for the students to observe something that you have primed them to observe by having a pre-lab that you've reconfigured conceptually and then a post-lab reflection where they have to treat this as though it was something they observed directly and analyzed. Um, I'm going to pause there and I'm going to pass things over to Anne Marie. Thank you, Margot. Hi, I'm Anne Marie Thomas. Um, I'm not in my office right now. If I turn off my background, I'm actually on the porch. It's snowing here. Um, but like many of you, um, I'm obviously not at my school. So I realized recently that for meetings with my students, I kind of like still having my office because I can show them a little bit of what I do with my background. Um, so now welcome to my office that I probably won't see for many months. Um, so I am a professor in both the School of Engineering and the School of Business, um, and I also teach in our engineering education program for K-12 teachers. And since everyone in this big audience right now is teaching very different types of labs, some of you are probably doing machining or mechanism design, some of you are doing chemistry, some of you are doing electrical engineering, um, I know we all have very specific differences in what sort of content we're trying to cover. Um, but I do want to go up front and just say one thing we should uh, differentiate for ourselves is the difference between teaching our labs online and teaching our lines online, labs online during a crisis. Um, and so many of you probably have taught classes online. I'm, I'm kind of lucky in that I've been teaching an engineering design for educators class for three years. But when I teach an online class, I typically plan it for months in advance and maybe mail materials out to those students because they've signed up for online and I've signed up to teach online. That's very different than our situation right now where many of us left our labs, uh, left our classrooms, and weren't sure if we were coming back and then found out that we're not coming back for a while. So I do think one thing is to give yourself and your students the grace of there is a difference between best practices for online education and labs and hands-on work and the good enough this semester is good enough and it's what we can do um, because we're not just teaching online suddenly, we're teaching online at a time of trauma for ourselves and our students. Um, also, I love the example of all the great online stuff and that was shown from ASU about getting onto the computers. Um, one of the things that many of you are probably running into, I know I am personally, is I have students who are suddenly at home sharing a computer with five people in a house or a trailer and don't have the Wi-Fi or the bandwidth right now or don't have a camera because they weren't gonna take online classes. So my advice for any labs um, is really to think about what, what is the big takeaway? And maybe you had six projects you wanted to do. Is there, are there two that are core to the, your, your lab? And then how can you modify them into a way to get through this semester? For the summer and for the fall, let's definitely think about how do we mail out materials or how do we have someone video the right labs? But we are in triage right now. Um, so something that I've been learning a lot from are my K-12 colleagues. Um, for the last three weeks, twice a day, along with a children's TV host, I've been hosting meetups, 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the evening, uh, every 12 hours, for educators of any sort to get together and share their notes. And we're all talking as college professors now, but again, we do have colleagues who are high school engineering teachers or second grade teachers, and they're all moving their stuff online as well. And many of them have done a lot of thinking and project-based learning. So I'd encourage you to look at how other people are making do, even at younger grade levels, to bring a little bit of hands-on. I know I was speaking with an engineering professor who typically has her students machine in metal, um, a sculpture project. They're switching to Lego that can be ordered and sent. Um, similar things, like that. So a lot of these little little tricks that we can we can pull in. Um, I, I will stop now because again, I know we have lots of questions and everyone's specific areas are different. Um, but I would say give yourself some grace and really, if you have the bandwidth, think for how am I getting through the next 10 weeks? And then how am I going to take my summer and fall classes? Because I think we all know from this point on, there should be an asterisk in our syllabus that says, in, in case of a disaster, we're going to be moving everything online. Right? We know that's coming. So best practices, we should think about. But I think, to be fair, this might be the semester that I actually cut my final group project and make it an individual project for bandwidth issues for my engineering design class. And I'm, I'm, I'm OK, a little sad, but OK with that. And that's my intro. Jennifer, if you want to go back to Q&A. Sure, absolutely. So we did have, um, thank you to everyone for, for sharing your intros. We've got a, a number of comments in the chat about examples of um, actual labs that are being done. And Michael uh, offered to share his screen. So Michael, can you 
Sure. I'm just do you have the ability to do that? And uh, I'm going to start the video. Perfect. So I'm, I'm Michael Goro. I'm also from ASU and I'm in electrical engineering. And we worked with the uh, Denise's group over the last two weeks to bring physical apps online. And the class I'm teaching is the intro to digital design. And we just switched over to a, an FPGA based uh, programming lab. So students uh, develop their designs in Intel Quadis. Some of them have uh, the software installed on their own machines, but uh, while uh, in our online program we require that, a lot of our face-to-face -face students had trouble because the software only runs on Linux machines and uh, Windows machines. About 30% of the students, they do have Macs. And this has been an uphill battle and a, a huge, huge issue. So moving forward, I'm thinking of different types of software that are more multi-platform. But again, we needed to get stuff done quickly. So let me just... Uh, share my screen real quick and uh, just briefly show you. I can also give you a post to a uh, video that I did and uploaded to YouTube for my students to show how it's done. So right now I have a standard browser open and I connect it to one of the lab machines that uh, uh, Sean showed. So I went through the Citrix receiver and uh, I'm seeing a standard Windows desktop. So you have the Quartus programming software here, but the interesting thing is once I click on camera, so the standard camera app, it actually shows me the USB camera that's connected. And uh, yeah, sorry, the webcam needs to be reoriented, but you have a board that uh, has the uh, Altera FPGA board mounted. And you see the LEDs flashing because right now it's the standard uh, um, file that's been uploaded. But this is connected to this digital and analog discovery. Usually students would program their board and use the physical switches to interact with the board. Right now they can't do that anymore but we still want them to be able to do the physical upload and the hardware and the loop test. So how can they do it now? They need to remap the pins. I will provide them with a pin map that uh, shows the connections between the analog discovery and the FPGA board. So in a physical sense, what they have to do then is either develop their design on this computer or simply go to the Citrix receiver and upload their design files. So I have everything prepped right now in this Lab 3 remote. And uh, let me just highlight them and uh, download these three files from my laptop right now to the so let me just put it on the desktop. I will clean it up afterwards. And uh, you can record. So the image is of course small, but you can record it in 1080p and the students can then download that video file after everything is said and done. So they have some, uh, I wouldn't say evidence, but something to, to take out of this. So once that is done, I can hit the programmer. So I will scroll down to the Intel programmer. So it's the light edition here. So that's the only beef that I have with it right now that uh, UI interaction is too slow for my taste. So that's what we've been working on and we still have to work on. So what Sean said, the, uh, 
the PCs cannot be shut down. So the USB blaster is already connected. And uh, if everything uploaded, yep, so the upload has, uh, progressed, so I can add the file. I select the programming file. So I just go to the desktop. And here I have my default, that's my flashing lights and my lab three. That is a counter lab. So I can do that. I will, I'll see the chip showing up and I can start the programming. Uh, sorry, I should have uh, made this one smaller. So now this thing has changed. There is only a zero here. Once I've done that, I can now click on this Lab 3 Remote Waveforms workspace that I also uploaded, and it will give me a workspace that has switches and push buttons, replacing what I had on the board here. If I click the enable, and clock, I should see things happening on the board. Great. So Michael, I do, I really appreciate yes. you sharing. I know, uh, I can send you yeah. a, um, it's exactly linked to a YouTube video. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's uh, I'm I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and not take up more time. So yeah, thanks. All right, thank you very much. And um, I know that you had uh, someone in the audience who is interested in learning more. So I'm gonna get their email address so you can connect separately. And if you can share that link out, that would be fantastic. Yes. Um, thank you so much for for jumping in. We've got. Um, We've got some other questions in the chat as well. So if anyone wants to, uh, any of our facilitators or anyone in the audience, we have a question about uh, experimental labs that require students to design and build experimental hardware that use data acquisition systems and sensor selection to meet measurement uncertainty requirements. Uh, so does anyone have any suggestions, any ideas uh, on what uh, this person could use? This is Mario. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a couple. One that I posted a link to in the chat already. That is a little baby handheld Arduino uh, system that the students can uh, put together and use it as, as a controls and measurement platform. Um, another one that I'll put a link to uh, shortly is about having students um, build their own, for example, spectrophotometer. Um, many of these are Arduino powered. Um, often this incorporates other maker technologies like a laser cutter to make the casing. Um, so you might have to ask students to use what they have at home, assuming they don't have a laser cutter available. But if you were able to send these out, uh, one of the beautiful things in uh, the uh, Arduino platform and having a task such as spectrophotometer is the, the students have to really think about what that data is coming in, how, su how often they should sample it, and uh, what it ought to mean. And they can hook it to a variety of computers to see what's happening. So I'll put that link there momentarily. And all of these, I loved Margaret's comment earlier citing the paper about what you're trying to get out of labs. It seems like in some of these cases when we're in sort of triage right now, if we can't get the students to design and build and have their hands on the actual equipment, can we set up situations where the instructor videotapes themselves doing the instructions, the experiment, and then sends the data to all the students? And then you can still have the collaboration and lab reports and the data analysis portion. Um, for, the, for the design side of things, I know a lot of universities, probably you're all doing this already, but for us, our SOLIDWORKS is now going through Amazon Web Servers, so all of our students can use CAD uh, for the mechanical program through their computers, uh, even if they're Macs. And in that case, we have a lot of students doing design, but maybe not actually getting to build it this semester. 
Uh, if we have a budget for it, we can try to send it off to 3D printing places. However, most of them are being used for protective equipment. But I love the idea that Margaret put of really asking ourselves, what are the elements of the lab that we're trying to pull out? And can we still, for this semester, emulate parts of those? Um, and another fun thing I want to mention, because I just realized I was putting up links to uh, things that are outside the network. Uh, there are some excellent keen cards that are found within the Engineering Unleashed website where people have had uh, class projects in which students built various uh, types of uh, equipment on their own. And so uh, one of our colleagues has put together a number of things under the heading of maker. And that would be the keyword that you wanted to look at in there because there you would see um, uh, examples of students making their own equipment. And some of that might be able to be repurposed nicely. So in Engineering Unleashed Keen cards. I would also suggest that among our, our Keen institutions, we're all teaching many of the same classes. And we might be able to pull through Keen what labs we're all trying to do and see if we can share resources in terms of access to virtual machines or videos we've created doing some of these experiments. Yeah, and Marie, I think that's a that's a great suggestion. And when I, I also got a question in the chat about whether or not we will compile all of the links that are being shared in the chat, we will. Uh, and what we'll do is take that information, we'll put it all together associated with the video for this call inside that virtual and online learning subnet. And then we'll send that link out with all of the links and the conversations, you know, the, sh the shared files that are out there. And then people will open a forum and people can share uh, additional questions, additional uh, videos, links, uh, courses that they're working on as well. And we can start to, to compile cards together. So I think that's a great that's a great suggestion. We can start to make this kind of a big comprehensive uh, set of resources. We have a, a question from Joanna that's gotten some additional interest in some, um, some activity in the chat. Does anyone know of video labs for materials testing, for example, concrete, steel, or wood in compression, tension, or elastic modules, especially one where students can take data from the video? So we do have some responses in the in the chat, but this was picked up by others as being a topic of interest. So any anyone want to jump in? Are any of my colleagues from St. Thomas here? Because I do know that our material science lab instructor, Genevieve Gagnon, has been going to the lab and doing our labs and taking video. And again, that might be a case where we can share that video and that data stream. I don't see any of them jumping okay. up, but that might be a follow up. Um. And I'm also going to call out, uh, I see John Falconer is or was on the call, and um, learnchemy.com has a lot of video resources. I don't know if they have the material science stuff. Hi, this is Allison Polisett from Campbell University. Um, we, I've been working with people in the materials division and ASCE to kind of post a lot of that stuff. And we do have a lot of videos that are posted on a separate server um, for lab experiments. And then Instron right now is making their, all of their materials, online materials testing courses free um, until June. So that might help if you're teaching strength of materials online or um, mechanical testing online and you can I put my email in the comments you guys can email me um, directly for some of that I guess who could I send it to at Keen that we could share it with or attach to this Allison uh, go ahead and send that to me Jennifer Young so I'm at jyoung at kffdn.org I think we are connected Uh, maybe I could jump in here for a second, uh, just because Margo mentioned Learn Chemi. And a number of the computer simulations that we have, I think are actually well suited to be used by students as a, as a lab. Uh, you know, we have a couple that have been used this semester by someone. Essentially, students can take data from the simulation because it covers a range of conditions and then um, analyze, write reports the same way they would do for a real lab. 
we have a couple hundred simulations. They're not all well suited as a lab, but I think a significant number are. A few are of the material science ones might be, but that's probably our weakest area. Thanks, John. Great. We did have a, a question um, about TAs, and, and the question was, do you, do you still need or expect a TA in the physical lab when students are using in the virtual lab? Um, so I, if, I don't know if that question is in regard to a specific uh, point that was shared, but if anyone wants to address the use of TAs in this space, that'd be great. That sounds somewhat ASU because they were talking about they had people both physically present and virtually present. So we did close the labs to, to physical access after a couple of weeks in once the state um, implemented uh, you know, more uh, stricter stay at home policies. But we do have some um, lab managers for some of the more physical oriented labs that are still taking appointments with students um, uh, as needed. Great, thank you, Sean. Uh, we have a, a topic of interest uh, around chemical engineering labs. Could anyone share old data sets and videos that can be given to students for data processing? Any general unit operated heat exchangers, uh, reactors, et cetera. Uh, if, if you have those, you can send them through the chat if you have them quickly. Otherwise, uh, please post them up into the subnet once we get that link and the recording of this shared out to everyone. That is a great idea that this is a good moment to make a repository, not just for, for Kemi, <laughs> but for the other folks that have old data sets and yes. uh, putting it inside Engineering Unleashed would be, would be good because it means that the students don't have free access to it all the time uh, it's uh, something we can see first and, and mediate their access. Yes, and we have another request, a uh, similar request, uh, but this time for uh, photonics, virtual photonics, biophotonics, optics, and biomedical optics. So if anyone has those resources as well, uh, we'll be looking for those. I think what we, what we may end up doing in the subnet is setting up a forum with disciplines that people can then uh, respond and share their resources and then you can look it up by discipline. But I will work with our community managers to get that set up the best way possible for sharing. I believe we have addressed all of the, the general questions that are in the chat. Uh, does anyone have a question that hasn't been addressed yet? I don't know, I joined a little bit late here, but I did want to point out that uh, Joe Connor, Oklahoma State University, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering with the College of Engineering as well. Uh, we are actually making unis, use of the National Instruments Elvis 3 unit uh, with its remote live capabilities. Uh, we're using the oscilloscope function generator and other major tools with it, as well as doing remote deployment uh, to the Rio and FPGA with that. Uh, at this time, it's limited the number of classes, but we do hope to expand that in the future. I can share one challenge that we do have. We have a couple of uh, labs that have Macs in them, and we couldn't do the same um, solution for those. So, but we did have them as dual boot. So right now we have them booting directly into Windows uh, to use the solution, but it has meant some of our uh, courses that uh, make use of Mac development tools that are only available on Macs. Um, our students don't have a uh, good remote solution for that. So if anybody does have suggestions for that, you know, we are all ears. Great. Yeah, everyone, everyone's kind of learning and experimenting all at the same time. Great, so we're getting some more links in the chat to videos and things and that those links will send out as well to everyone. And um, I, I do appreciate everyone sharing the resources coming, coming on board here to kind of 
let us know what's of interest. Any other questions that anyone wants to throw out to the, the group? We've got about 10, 15 minutes left. I mean, I'll just say if we've got uh, a, a quiet moment, I've taken this opportunity to embrace asking the students to show me what they know through a uh, mechanism of their choosing. Uh, so there's, there's lots of the, the class that my lower flammability limit conceptual experiment was for uh, is chemical engineering thermodynamics. There's lots of places chemical engineering thermodynamics can show up around your home. And uh, so what I am asking them to do instead of my traditional final exam is to uh, find something that demonstrates one of the core principles of the class, model it in some, and describe it in some mathematical way, and then expand upon it. And so something that um, you might consider doing if it is appropriate for your class is asking the students to find the lab that exists where they are right now. Uh, because we are surrounded by applications of uh, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, civil engineering, and so on. And so maybe the students will invent things uh, that, from their own observations that will uh, pleasantly surprise us and give us good things to work on for next time. Right, you know, and Margot, I think that's a that's a great point. I know one of the one of the things with um, a lot of the keen partners when they're looking at some of the, I, I don't know if these are so much labs, but you could maybe do something with them. So things like thermo using cooking and uh, hair dryers and, and curling irons and things like that to be able to uh, have those. And, and I think a lot of people have those items in their space. We have a couple questions in the chat. So Micah is asking, uh, curious what we can send physically to students to help them. So Margot mentioned Arduino-based kits. And this question specific to Anne-Marie, what do you send in support of your de design course? And does anyone have other suggestions that could be helpful? Sure. And again, I think a lot of this comes down to the doing it in real time and making it up as we go along and the planning ahead. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Deb Besser, is the chair of our civil engineering department, um, saw the writing on the wall earlier than many of us and actually packed up boxes of materials that people could use for a structures lab um, and actually ship them out. She, we should have seen the writing there that she had boxes sent them. So her students have boxes of materials. I'd have to ask her what she said. I think it was for trusses and structures. Um, for, for design class in general, it really depends on what we're teaching. We often will send packages um, planned in advance with things like, it could be an Arduino or it could be Makey Makey. Um, in terms of Arduino, I know it's a great tool. However, getting it right now is a tricky and also is an added cost for students. I will add that if you go to um, Autodesk to Tinkercad, Tinkercad Electronics has a full Arduino simulator in it um, that runs in browser. So you can actually upload code, you can add LEDs, and you can do your electrical labs through that. Again, probably a triage mode version. It's not maybe what you wanna do if you're planning this in advance and having the students buy a kit in the beginning. But if right now you want students doing basic circuit experiments, um, with the classes I teach for K-12 educators, I actually do use the Autodesk Tinkercad free um, circuit um, simulator. Uh, and it works quite well. Um, I do that a lot with lower income school districts too when we work. That gives them a chance if the class is sharing like one Arduino, they can all test things and then we can pass it around. So again, for this semester, looking at Autodesk for, as a substitution for Arduino might not be a bad idea. Um, for design specific projects though, it depends on what I'm doing to answer Micah's question. And we can, we can send specific craft materials and other things. We can send Lego. Um, I know there's a quite a few professors that are moving, even moving to Lego Technic uh, to do some of their linkages labs right now. Um, it's hard if you're trying to do it right now because of shipping delays. But planning for summer, as a lot of us, I know our university has announced that all of our classes this summer will also be online. So those of us teaching engineering classes this summer, we have enough time to get mailing addresses from students and possibly require things like a, a home data analysis tool or an Arduino. Um, but yeah, so I, I know that's a very vague answer, but I think all of us are teaching such different things. Um, it kind of comes down to what 
what is our budget and how do we not make this an undue burden on our students, particularly right now? Oh, I, actually, can I answer Thank Maria's question though? Because I'm doing this right now. I see yes, the follow-up. Absolutely. Thanks, Anne Marie. Sure. I just see that Maria wrote, do you think labs or teams of students work on a single build design project uh, is re possible remotely? Um, and the comment there was, it says specifically hardware. And so I'd love to hear from my friends who are having them build hardware. We, I have groups of students, freshmen in design class right now, working together on CAD models of their work. Um, and for students with low computer access, we've switched to doing some hand drawings of things, but they're still communicating with the client they would have been working with. Um, so collaboration works if they have a way of communicating. Um, and for some of, the, some of my students, it's been, it's been phones right now if, they're, if they just don't have the Wi-Fi. Um, I'd love to hear though, if anyone is doing collaborative hardware projects right now, remotely. So we kind of are, um, this is Mario. Um, we've got a freshman design build project that we had to completely transition um, during this time. And we ended up moving to a project being much simpler, um, but unfortunately each individual on the team has to do the build themselves. So we ended up moving to designing things like cardboard shoes and that kind of stuff that they could build out of materials that they have on hand, but they still learn from the hardware experience and then redesign based on their experience. And so they can communicate from their team how things went, what things worked well, and then how to redesign for the next prototype, how to improve it uh, in some way. But it's not the same thing, obviously, because each person is individually dealing with their own prototype. And I'm wondering if there's any way that, I can't think of any way where we could have a team of students working on a single hardware system. I just don't see the time lag being possible, uh, but maybe there's some other ideas people have about that, which I'd love to hear. I'd wonder if you could do almost like a, um, like a pass the baton essentially for a team build like that, where each person, you know, is going to have to do the iteration, but um, they create the prototype and then the next person would have to use that prototype, do some user testing. Um, it might be their own personal experience with it. And then they document how they change the prototype and then pass it on to the next person. That's really cool. That sounds like a neat idea. Aris Cleanthus from the University of Maryland, College Park. I teach a, uh, the senior design capstone course for mechanical engineers. And uh, the prototype and testing aspect of the project used to be a fairly substantial part of the semester uh, and a fairly substantial part of the effort. So we've completely eliminated that and decided or opted to uh, focus more heavily on the design detail and the analysis. And so that uh, teams are directed to do more specific design uh, for a production level design as opposed to focusing on designing for a prototype, which usually in the past has led teams to make decisions that were suited for a quick prototype based on the resources they had available to them, but not necessarily thinking about what the product could look like if they had a manufacturing factory at their disposal. Uh, so we're focusing more on the higher quality level of the design, uh, driving more uh, design tools, uh, in-depth uh, uh, application of those tools, we're focusing more heavily on the analysis part and looking for a higher quality uh, design at the end. Thank you very much. We have a, a question for those with past experience with remote labs. Uh, can you share any comments about how well the students using virtual are prepared now compared with students who perform in physical labs? Um, sure, and, and I, I want to jump in on this because I, I started answering it in text just in case oh. we wouldn't be able to get to it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, there's a, there is a pretty significant literature on this because people would really like to know. Uh, it would be a lot cheaper and easier if we didn't have to maintain a whole bunch of laboratory equipment at all of our institutions. So uh, it depends, this is one of my colleagues' favorite answers, it depends on what objectives that are most important to you. So the students can be equally well prepared, less well prepared, 
or better? Um, all of those are true answers. Uh, it's better. Uh, we have studies showing it's better for uh, some aspects of conceptual learning. It's better uh, to help students focus on and attend to the right things. For example, in, um, in a real experiment, the students might be very focused on getting the next sample or how the machine's not working properly, et cetera. Um, whereas in the virtual one, uh, that doesn't happen. So they are much more clearly focused on uh, the concepts that are going by. Um, however, uh, if what you really care about is how people uh, learn how to use the actual machine um, or the psychomotor of titrating or soldering, um, that they will be less well prepared because they're not doing that exact task anymore. Uh, so it depends. Um, I think we can try at the moment to shoot for the things that uh, virtual does well. And there is a, a lot of literature on this. I can point to some nice examples for you uh, afterwards in the uh, data repository. Thank you, Margo. Any other thoughts on, on what you've seen? Uh, anyone else wanna jump in on this, this topic? And there's one other question out there uh, as well about the mix of recorded labs uh, and telepresence labs. And, and so we can kind of jump in if anyone's got uh, best practices or thoughts on that as well. Any of our ASU facilitators or Anne Marie, do you want to jump in on any of the questions around mix? I can't help with that mix because I haven't done any virtual labs. Okay. So passing to the others. All right. So I want to thank everyone um, for the all the links that are coming into the chat. So uh, we will definitely be pulling them in. Um, and I see Michael, you shared uh, a response in chat. So we'll make sure to, to get that shared out with everyone as well. I know that this has been, you know, as, as mentioned before, there's a big mix of people on, on this call. We had over, uh, we had, 100 people on the call and our cap was 100. So I don't know how many more people we're trying to get on. This is obviously a hot topic. We are going to give it some more attention and, and make sure that we have uh, shared the resources out with everyone. And uh, if, if it seems like there's a, a good um, opportunity to have more discussions, we may do those in more breakout specific disciplines. Uh, but definitely more to come on this. So I want to I want to thank everyone for coming. I really want to thank our our facilitators, Anne Marie, Margot, Sean, and Denise. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to to Michael for for jumping on as well. Um, we really appreciate it. We will get all of these resources out as soon as we possibly can because we know time is of the essence here. Um, any last uh, thoughts, uh, words of wisdom to share before we sign off? Good luck, everybody. Keep. I think we're all we're all doing our best. I think that's the key thing. It's not going to be it's not going to be our probably maybe our best semester. But I think again, I mean, we're all here to teach. So just keeping the students in mind. Um, I will mention again that twice a day weekdays. Um, I am part of a group that is meeting for half an hour, um, and I can send that link out to you. But uh, it is a mix of formal and informal in all age groups. But I've learned a ton from other educators. And if you just are sick of being by yourself in your house, I want to meet global educators for a short break for coffee every morning. Um, I can share that out. Great. Thank you, Anne Marie. Uh, I see a question about is the chat saved in the recording? I believe the chat is saved separately. So we'll have the recording with the audio and video, but then we'll, we'll have the relevant items from the chat, the questions, the answers, the links all posted alongside the video in the, uh, in the forum, in the subnet. All right, 
Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful afternoon and weekend. Thank you for everything that you are doing for, for your students and for each other. I know this is tough and we will try to be as helpful a resource as possible uh, as, we, as we drive forward to the move to virtual. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you.